our next speaker is Dr. Joanna Bryson. Currently, she's the Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Bath. But starting in February of 2020, she will begin a new role as Professor of Ethics and Technology at the Herte School in Berlin. She's a transdisciplinary researcher on the structure and dynamics of human and animal-like intelligence. Her research covers topics from AI through anatomy, uh, sorry, through autonomy and robot ethics, and on to human cooperation. And she's appeared in venues from Reddit to science publications. And I took the time this week to check out her AMA on Reddit or science. It's absolutely fascinating. I ended up spending 90 minutes inside of there that I didn't have, but I recommend it. She holds degrees in psychology from the University of Chicago in Edinburgh and artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh and MIT. She has additional experience in professional research at Princeton, Harvard, Oxford, and Lego, with technical experience in Chicago's financial industry and international management consultancy. She also is the author of a book, Robots Should Be Slaves. <laughs> I find that amusing. And she will be speaking today on intelligence by design, systems engineering for the coming era of AI regulation. And please welcome Dr. Joanna Bryson. So, uh, hi. So, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm leaving computer science, and that's why my computer stopped working. No, I, I don't know why. All right, so uh, I normally get asked to talk about ethics, but here I've been asked to talk about uh, systems engineering. So that leads in uh, neatly to the talk we're just in. Um, and I love, it, I love it when people ask me to talk about systems engineering because I really do have a PhD in AI, and I, and I, uh, I do build systems, right? So, um, but I'm going to start with a few ethics questions. So who is responsible if something goes wrong with AI? Uh, this guy, right? For this, for God, right? Yeah, OK. <laughs> right? Um, another question we need to ask is, how do we govern the commercial use of AI? And I guess from what I've heard from the first two talks here, this is my first talk conclusion as well, so we are both uh, novices here, uh, the, the, um, that a lot of you are using AI in commercial settings. So I think I'm talking to a lot of you about how you can deal with uh, what's going to happen with governance. But before we can talk all about this, we have to talk about uh, what is AI. And I think you may have noticed the first two speakers were using the term slightly different even from each other. And I have to admit, I, I am going to come closer to, to uh, JD. <laughs> All right. So uh, intelligence is the capacity to do the right thing at the right time, All right, to generate action from perception. Now, that's a definition that's more than a century old. It's, it's something that, that we don't have to really argue about. If you want to, we can. But the whole point about definitions, they're not science. It's not something you discover. It's something you choose. It's a policy so that you can talk. And so this is how I'm going to use the term through the whole talk. And then it makes it really easy to define AI. OK, AI is a subset of all the intelligent stuff that we're responsible for, <laughs> OK, that we built. Right? Very simple. All right? So then, um, yeah, some people will say, oh, because I built, and again, I didn't hear this from either of the previous speakers, but because, you know, we, we've, we've built it, or we put a random number generator in it, or, you know, we understand autonomy, we aren't responsible, no, right? There's nothing about this that changes responsibility. The whole idea that, that a CTO is responsible for the company shows you that even with other humans, which are purely autonomous, that you still have responsibility for a situation that you create and enable, right? So we shouldn't be surprised by this, but some people really don't like it, <laughs> right? So again, uh, I think this, this is like an audience of most of the people who are computer scientists. So this slide I'm going to go through very quickly to make up for the time I've lost. Um, but again, the way I've just defined intelligence makes it a form of computation. It's a transformation of information. You're taking a context and generating an action, okay? It's not math. And I think a lot of the misunderstandings of AI that people have comes from mistaking intelligence for mathematics, right? Mathematics is an abstraction. It's, it can be perfect and eternal because it's not real, OK? Anything computational takes time, space, and energy. It's a physical process, right? And getting the right thing to do at the right time is a process that requires search. Machine learning is also a kind of search. You're searching for the right parameters that kind of give you the right answer when you have the matching these, these uh, 
tech sets or whatever it is you want to do with your machine learning. But I'm going to use the old, pot, the old examples we used to use just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem. And these are trivial. This is just like, uh, you know, like, like the really simple example. You've got a robot with 100 possible actions, OK? If, if you don't know everything that robot can do, you're hoping that the robot can get out the door, right? The, the first thing, if it, if it happens to have an action that, the, that, you know, that was built into it, that is get out the door, it still might have to guess 100 things to find that action. If it has to do two things, like turn left and then go forward, that's 10,000 possible actions already. This is combinatorial explosion. All of you that are computer scientists should recognize this, right? This is, this is why you can't know and it can know everything, all right? Taking this a little further, even chess, which by now we all know is trivial compared to Go, right? There's more possible short chess games than atoms in the universe. Right? And if you don't believe this, the guy that invented information theory did the first proof of this. It's been simplified a bit since then, but go Google it. I don't have time to explain it. <laughs> but the point is, in real life, you have a lot more options and a lot more than 35 moves. Right? So there's not going to be a single algorithm that is going to, uh, somebody is going to discover because they have all the data, um, and then that country is going to be a missing. That's not going to happen. All right? So what we do instead is we do things like concurrency. So you have two computers. You can get through the, the problem maybe almost twice as fast. There's always an overhead cost of trying to combine the information. But you have to have twice as much space and twice as much energy. And that's why I don't usually use the iPad, because I just accidentally touched it, and you got the next bill, but it doesn't matter. OK, so, uh, uh, so yeah, you need more energy. So quantum may change things, right? In theory, for certain kinds of cases, you don't, you don't have to have twice as many computers uh, to, to, to search twice as many things at the same time. But nobody's actually done the computations on energy. Because again, people, they were all mathematicians, and they weren't thinking about it. right? <laughs> and, the, and, and empirically, it's looking really bad. From everybody I've been able to talk to, it's been actually worse. The more qubits you need, the harder it is to get them to focus and turn up where you want them to turn up. And so this has been one of the big challenges people have been facing with, with quantum. So it isn't the case that, that suddenly everything is going to change entirely, although, of course, quantum is going to change a few things. All right? So yeah, artificial general intelligence, in the sense of omniscience, is not actually a problem. OK? No one algorithm is going to solve AI suddenly. That's why these kinds of really interesting cases that we've been hearing from both the previous speakers are the kinds of things that solve these things. All right, so how do people get so much done, right? <laughs> well, partly concurrency in our own heads, that the, the nerves are all running, but they aren't all running. Actually, it's a very sparse thing, or your head would explode. Um, but anyway, you do have concurrent search in your head. But more importantly, we are really good, compared to other animals, at sharing the outcomes of that search. Remember I talked about that overhead when you have two computers, right? So we're very good at that. We have language. And now we have more than language, we have machine learning. All right. And so that allows us to do all these things that we've gotten to superhuman. I mean, not much past superhuman, right? But it's things like lips reading, deception, detection. I mean, these slides, sorry for the slightly old slides. But hey, you know, Boston Dynamics, doesn't it look like it's two guys? It's a pantomime horse, right? And then where are the guys' heads? Why? Because they've actually not only machine, they're not only using um, a lot of really interesting algorithms and, and a lot of hard work in engineering. But also, they've done uh, motion capture. So they're mining not only the computation that people have done before, but also the computation nature did during evolution. right? So, so the reason we've made so much progress in this, and of course this was uh, down here, was uh, um, the, the um, Watson thing that was mining all kinds of texts, including Wikipedia. right? A lot of that is because we've been able to exploit the computation that our culture and biology has been doing for a very long time. So, so that's a lot of what's been happening in the last 10 years, again, because we've been getting so much data. So it's not that we've been massively exceeding human capacities, except that things we don't really do very well, like video forgery, right? So handwriting forgery, reading lips, things like that, we're coming up to human levels. But, but with something like video forgery, of course, there's no equivalent. Uh, so anyway. But the other thing here to recognize is that just because we've gotten more and more better at solving certain kinds of intelligence problems, 
it doesn't mean that technology itself is becoming more human in some essential way. All right? So yeah, intelligence is a form of computation. AI extends and uses ours, and machine learning uploads the stuff we've already done. And one of the consequences of this, which has again already been mentioned uh, uh, by the first speaker, was is that um, that the biases that are in our society will stay in our society. And actually, one of the interesting things, so this is a paper that came out in 2017 and made headlines um, that we took something called the implicit association test, where you found out humans' implicit biases at how fast they could do tasks that, for example, combine women's names and math terms and men's names and, and reading terms versus the other way around. And humans are way faster at associating math than men. And at least these are like Americans, sorry. <laughs> but I assume that it's true in a lot of cultures, uh, at least in English, because we mined the entire, in fact, we did it. We just used other people's mindings. We used, um, the Google, we used Google's, uh, Google News, and we also used the Stanford thing, uh, uh, Glove and the Comic Crawl. So we used standard word embedding technology that's in a lot of people's products, and we, sh and we replicated all the prejudices that psychologists have found in humans. Right, it, that they're there in the word embeddings. But then, because we had them in the word embeddings, we did something the psychologists couldn't do, right? Which over here, this is looking at, so again, this is, so the, the common crawl mines the entire English language web. And so we used that and compared, here's these terrible sexist word embeddings that you know, associate women uh, with reading and humanities and stuff like that, and men with math and, and careers. Uh, and then here's the actual proportion of people, oh sorry, the dots are the names of jobs, okay, from the US labor statistics. And the, the x-axis here is the actual proportion of people holding those jobs that are women. So the implicit biases, what we've shown using AI, is that the implicit biases that were being picked up by the psychologists were not just the evil of, of, of society, it may be evil, but it's also our lived experience, okay? So that's really interesting because it sort of shows us that our implicit behavior isn't actually our ideal, right? The, our ideals are things that we construct that we, when we're trying to negotiate and create a better world, right? So when we say we don't want to be sexist, we want to be, see some uh, diversity when we look at a room like this, uh, that is a, a target that we're choosing and we're trying to move towards. It's very important when we use machine learning that we recognize that it's very easy to pick up the past and not necessarily the ideal, that, that even the human brain has different, you know, the conscious part and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the less intentional parts are, are segmented and modularized, okay? So why should we care about accountability and transparency? And, and I don't know if I remember saying <laughs> that we did, but this is one of the key things we should worry about if we're worrying about regulation, all right? So what is transparency? It's information lets you know what your system is doing. So I got into systems engineering because I wanted to build AI to do psychology. I actually, my first degree is psychology, right? So I actually wanted to understand how things work. But the same things that help people debug AI also help people understand AI, and they can help governments regulate AI. And that might sound scary to you, but think of it a different way. Or think about your competitors. What if they're doing stuff that you know is wrong and that you know you could do, but you've chosen not to do, right? So the point of having a government is that there's somebody that you can throw that ball over the fence to and say, hey, we had some laws about this. Could you please enforce them so we don't all race to the bottom? All right? So, so, so being transparent is a way to protect yourself. And I want to say this isn't about trust. Nobody should trust AI. AI is a system that, that is, uh, you know, that, 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 that it's, not, it's not something you negotiate with. It's technology. It's about information. It's about making transparent whether or not it really works in a way that's believable, at least to trusted auditors. It's not saying you have to open source everything. <clears throat> okay. And notice this requires cybersecurity. Basically, if you're going to keep information about what your intentions were and whether you followed good procedures, all those logs have to be cybersecure. All right. Accountability is telling you how much information you want to keep around for the transparency, right? So accountability is the thing where we actually say, how responsible are you? What are you responsible for? 
In other manufacturing areas, you have to follow best practice. And people expect to go through and say, you know, is this a terrible accident because your machinery just you know, killed someone? You would go and check and see, uh, did you follow best practice when you built that thing? Right? So normally, we, we are accountable for what our products do unless we can prove that we did the right thing, in which case it's a pretty good chance that the user did the wrong thing. Right? And for us, anybody making digital artifacts, AI or not, we also need to be able to prove or, or help people track if there was cybersecurity that made our systems not work. We don't want our systems to be hazardous for our users, right? Okay. So transparency is a way of allowing us, allowing us developers to demonstrate that we did due diligence, that we don't have accountability, right? So, so that we have behaved accountably and so if there's a problem with somebody else's, all right? Okay, so only humans can be accountable. This follows from what I said a little bit before. Uh, some people think, like, let's take the, the, the artifact itself, like the driverless car, let's just make it responsible for itself. And this has been a suggestion in order to uh, help, for example, European car companies compete with uh, American car companies. Not so much the car companies, they're more on the level playing ground. It's Google and Apple that have more money than they can legally spend and they're saying, oh, yeah, sure, we'll take on liability for anything our cars do. Well, that's an unfair competitive advantage. Yes, it's an unfair co competitive advantage, and it needs to be handled, including why is it they have more money than they can legally spend? There's some problems with uh, taxing and redistribution, right? But it's not the best solution is not to say, hey, European car companies, why don't you fully automate part of your business process and we'll cap your tax and your legal liabilities? What a great idea. Again, this comes back to employment. It's just not what you want to do. So we cannot dissuade a machine. We cannot build a machine to be reliably dissuaded. Okay? If we put in the, the dissuasion module, we can take out the dissuasion module. If we build a system in such a complicated way that we can't take out the dissuasion module, then it's not a safe, reliable system. Okay? So basically, for us, we don't even understand. You can get people who've lost a relative who, who then see the murderer go to jail, and they say, oh, I've got something back. No, you've got nothing back. Someone going to jail is nothing like having a relative. But you believe it because it's so much a part of our culture. We aren't going to build in that kind of systemic sociality into AI, right? It's just not going to happen. Um, and so it's, you know, <laughs> no penalty of law and acted directly against an artifact, including a shell company. This is how you can get corruption. If you have a company that nobody cares if it goes bankrupt, right? That's already too much of an artifact. And so AI would be the ultimate shell company, right? And, and that was a very short version of a relatively long paper with two lawyers, which therefore now some people think I'm a law person. I, I actually, it's my only, no, I have not a second law paper. Anyway, but anyway, I am not a lawyer. But this is, but if you want to read it by better people than me about legal personality, go ahead and have a look. All right. So, the British actually tried to come up with some solutions. And when you talk about AI ethics, what's the first thing you think? Actually, now there's been so much, but what was you know, 10 years ago the first thing you would think if you talked about moral and AI? Oh, let's see if this helps. Okay, here's the first three rules we have. So, um, yeah, so people talk about principles. These are the first ones. And the reason was because the British, uh, like Noel Sharkey, some of the big AI ethics thinkers, had said we need to be thinking about robot ethics, but then they didn't think of the deliverable. So the academics, in desperation, came up with this idea, let's make a set of principles. And do you recognize these? Robots are multi-use tools. Uh, they shouldn't kill or harm humans. Humans, not robots, are responsible agents. That one's a little harder to see what's, what's happening there. And then robots are products. They should be safe and secure. These are Asimov's laws, revised to make sense. Okay, first of all, you don't have that combinatorial impossibility of actually the robot magically knowing what's going to happen next. But also, the robot itself is not responsible. Here, we're talking about the manufacturer responsibility, and there's actually five British principles of robotics. The fourth and the fifth are about what the, the user has to have, right? So the, the idea is that robots, uh, again, should not be designed in a deceptive way so that people believe that the machine needs help when it doesn't, right? So there needs to be transparency. And then finally, that the legal responsibility for the AI has to be attributed, right? And this has just become law recently for drones, that, that you have to know for every drone 
whose it is. It has to be licensed. It has to be. It has to be clear whose it is. Now, these may look familiar not only because maybe you read old stuff, but also because this year, 42 governments signed up to a very similar list, right? That the OECD put together. They switched three and four. I don't know why. So now you can't see the Asimov's laws as well. And they massively improved them. All the orange stuff is improved, right? So they talk now about things that really matter, like uh, sustainability. And they talk about uh, human rights as sort of a basis about the dignity and things like that. And they talk about uh, means to challenge outcomes. Some of this you can see in the Euro EU through the GDPR, right? Um, and you can also see this is a wonderful thing that the EU has been working on that you know, if you think about the internet thing, of things or whatever, they have to be secured through the product lifetimes. And in the EU, you don't get to say, oh, you, know, you have to throw out a light bulb in two years and then hope people do with your internet of things light bulb that you can only keep cyber secure for two years. No, if the EU has noticed that most people keep their light bulbs for five years, then five years is how long you have to keep your light bulb cyber secure. So none of this like putting in terms and conditions fine print that it's the user's fault. So anyway, so this stuff is great, but again, I want to point out that, that there's been a lot of, there's like 90 odd uh, things, and this, and this other thing coming back, uh, uh, see this is the, this last piece, that, that the transparency and accountability are running through all of these, also human centeredness, which was, was unbelievably arguable before. Okay, so I think I've got, oh, I've got a few minutes left, amazing. Let's talk about the design of intelligence. Um, again, it isn't that somebody discovers, I don't have to tell you this, but I have to tell politicians this. They really believe that someone will discover an algorithm and then suddenly will get magic. And that's partly because big companies have been telling them, oh, deep, you know, deep learning was that algorithm, right? So, so it isn't that you just think of an algorithm and then, and then all of a sudden you get robots, sadly, right? There's, I was just talking to a robot manufacturer. <laughs> um, uh, so, so for example, and again, I think you guys should know this, maybe you don't. Do you guys realize this? It, I, in fact, I learned this in Singapore, at <laughs> the Singapore Financial, that Google has its own fiber optic network because of, I have heard that a little bit. They don't trust other people not to read the fiber optics, but they have their own chips. The EU does not have its own chips, right? They can't build their own chips. Google does. Um, I think probably initially for speed, but of course it has cybersecurity consequences. Um, and they have enormous factories for generating power. Again, if you're sitting here arguing, it used to be people said, oh, it's so unfair, Google has all the algorithms. So Google's like, oh, hey, have our algorithms. And then everybody's like, wait, why are they doing that? It's because they have all the data. Even Google, they have all the data, right? It's not just about algorithms or data. There's unbelievable amounts of physical infrastructure that are wrapping the planet that these companies have. The level of inequality is astounding. And that's why I'm really happy to see that, you know, when we have competitors coming from other regions, we need to do that. But you have to recognize there's some incredible amount of stuff going on here. All right, these are major power sources, and if they don't have to just be reined back, I think they need to be cooperated with, because we all know governments aren't entirely reliable either, right? So these are new, huge power sources we have to deal with. All right, so let's see. Um, so, yeah, AI actually facilitates transparently honest accounting, right? And that's because it's software. Right? So it's really easy. We all know that you can do revision control, right? Everybody here uses revision control all the time, right? I, I don't even have my papers there right now as an academic. But, so, but it's not just about adding or changing lines of code. You need to keep track of the data libraries and the software libraries that you've used. You don't know if you can trust every software library you find on the internet. And depending on what your product is and what it's going to get plugged into, you could be creating a hole for other people. So you need to keep track of these things, right? Um, and, and I'm going around telling governments, hey, guess what? People can keep track of this stuff. So they may be coming and auditing this stuff if you want to do work in the EU, right? So, and keeping track of your training and testing procedures. How are you sure it was ready to go, right? When did you let hit the release button, all right? And then there's also the question of the active systems performance. Now, people are saying, well, is this even possible? Uh, well, yes, it's possible for all kinds of things. Again, oh no, we don't have deep understanding of deep neural networks. Who cares? We don't need to know what every weight is. We need to know that stuff I had on the last slide. We need to know what the humans did and if they followed the correct, correct procedures, right? In the worst case, AI is inscrutable of humans, but we don't go into a bank and say, explain to me what that accountant's synapses do in its brain, 
right? No, we don't, we don't do that. We go in and say, did they follow proper procedures, all right? And actually, people have been working for a long time to, uh, well, oops, yeah, yeah. First of all, you can set up things that you just set limits and say, does it look like it's using the right amount of power? Who's getting access to data? I mean, that's what the apps, when the iTunes, when Apple is checking your, your apps, they check like just for flows of data. But also, we, you know, this is an established thing. We can actually go and look at complex models. We can also do things like digital forensics, where we just send other inputs and see if we got different decisions. So we can figure out the landscape of what, went, what happened with a with complicated system. So there's lots of people working on these problems. You know, Facebook lets, lets its programmers hack the code in their giant AI program, like in real time. And what happens is then they sort of sandbox in-house, and then they slowly release out, and they check for all kinds of things, including having lots of little monitoring programs. Right? There's lots of little monitoring programs that are, that are running all the time to see if things look like they're going okay. They're relatively simple. Right? But think about this also if you don't believe Facebook, which, you yeah. <laughs> know, if you don't believe me as an academic, think about every time there's been a driverless car fatality. Right? We all know, it's been the front page news, what went wrong within, within like two days, right? That's because the automobile industry, people already figured out, is really deadly and dangerous. So it's regulated, and so they have to keep track of this stuff, including their software. And so you can go in and say, oh yeah, here's what it's, the machine saw, and this is what it did, and this is why we designed it to do it that way. And they can report that. And then and they, they can report it in a way that newspapers can, can report Right, as well as the governments can decide liability about. All right, so I, I did something called behavior and design. I don't think I really have time to go into it in great depth, but the, the main idea is that you can do something called object joint design, right? <laughs> but that, um, and, and the, AI, the AI also requires development and architecture. So there's modules around, uh, around uh, what, you, what you're actually learning and what's changing, and then you also need to, um, say what are the, 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 what are the um, priorities between the different modules, okay? And so that's done uh, with something called posh plans, which are actually basically behavior trees derived from these. Um, and so we do things like, oh, this is real-time inspection. Oh, sorry, I should have turned the sound off. Uh, anyway, the, these are real-time inspection tools for going through and seeing if the priorities are working and seeing if the system's working okay. But anyway, compared to the stuff you already saw this morning, I, I think it's pretty boring, so I'll just skip over that. I will say that the same thing that helps human, like, that developers, programmers, professional programmers understand what's going on with the code also does help humans, uh, ordinary, naive humans, understand what's going on with the code. Um, but I'll skip over that too. We're worried that we anthropomorphize so that people's brains shut off, um, but we're still uh, exploring this. Uh, even if you dress it up though as a bee, that already changes how people perceive the robot, which is amazing. Anyway. So uh, I don't think I have time for this either because I've only got a minute left. I'll just flash by this stuff. I have a whole ton of stuff. It's, are you guys worried about the robots? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it's not really a double standard. But one of the things that I say is that it would be uh, that robots should be slaves. It's not a book. It's just a book chapter. But the idea is that we've already decided you should not own people. So, so whatever your standard is for what a person is, don't build that. But, but secondly, um, yeah, you're not going to, oh, actually, I have a better slide about this coming up. Let me, sh let me show, yeah, let me skip over this, sorry, let me get to this. Yeah, what about the robots for analogical experience, but what about a cows? Okay, we can't all agree about how to treat cows, and even if we could, we wouldn't be treat, agreeing about how to treat rats. Okay, and these are animals that have something much more like our physiological response, right? They, they have the same kinds of things that feel what it's like when they hear, like when, you, when it gets to be the time when you take the cows away from the cows and they're crying for each other that night. I don't know if you've been to a dairy farm uh, in, in the night. Uh, that's the same way it feels if, if mothers and children can't find themselves, can't find each other, right? The, the, the emotion stuff is something we've evolved that's very similar. You're not gonna have that same phenomenological link with something you've built out of silicon. It just isn't the same. So, so I can't tell you exactly at what point something becomes its, itself a moral agent, but I will say that let's, let's solve the rats first because they're a lot closer, and then you can worry about the robots later. But in the meantime, since we're designing it, let's build it so we don't have to worry. Like, for example, back it up. <laughs> right? You can't back up a rat. You can back up a robot. Okay. 
So we're obliged to build AI, we're not obliged to. And that was the point of the slaves chapter. Okay, so should we regulate AI? Yes, we already do. All commerce is already regulated. We just need to do it better. Regulatory bodies needs, are needed that understand software and DevOps so that we can actually have honest conversations and use government as a tool to keep our industries going fast and being agile and doing the things that we want to do. All right? Expect uh, those who build and use AI to be accountable and to prove that they're doing due diligence. And we need to work with and innovate governments. We have to help create governments that can help us do our jobs. Okay? It takes time to go and talk to governments and get them to understand our industry so that they can do this well. And we need to pay tax. Right? If we don't pay tax, there isn't anybody to do this stuff for us. And to, you know, there's not roads and nice, nice lights and things like that. Okay, thanks to my collaborators and to you and to you guys. <laughs>